Hello and welcome to the Tabletop Bellhop Express Check-In. Today I'm recapping Tabletop Bellhop Live Episode 26, Digestif. I'm Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back at the games that are tabletop in the last week. My week started off with a three-player short game of Dinosaur Island. It went much better than last week's two-player learning game. Dinosaur Island is basically an unlicensed Jurassic Park board game. You're harvesting DNA, learning dinosaur patterns, improving your park by hiring staff, building attractions, and raising more dinos. Each round, visitors are going to come to your park, and you better hope your security level is high enough, or else some of those dinos may get out and eat your patrons. I love the theme, but man, this game is a table hop. I'm also finding the short game to be far, far too short. It's an engine building game, and it feels like all I've done is put in some gas and not even started the engine. Now, I am looking forward to trying a medium or long game to see if that's more rewarding. Up next was Kodama the Tree Spirits by Daniel Solis. This is a beautiful card drafting game I first got to try at Origins 2015. In Kodama, each player starts with a tree trunk that has a feature on it. Each round, players are going to draft a new branch to add to their tree. They score points by creating chains of like features. Now these features are things like mushrooms, worms, flowers, clouds, etc. In addition to scoring points for matching features, you're also going to get bonus points by using your Kodama, which are a set of cards you get at the start of the game that each have a Kodama, a tree spirit on them, that are these cute Miyazaki looking creatures. They're going to give you bonus points for doing uh, set collection things or having multiple branches or having the tallest tree and so on. You're going to use one Kodama per season and play through three seasons, spring, summer, and fall, and then in winter there's a final scoring round. The player with the most points at the end of the final scoring wins the game. Now, I am a big fan of this game. It is one of the most visually stunning games in my collection. It just looks right on the table. It's also very easy to teach and a very solid drafting game. Just make sure you cover scoring at least twice before you start, as I have seen people mess it up. Now, after Kodama, a friend asked to try out Sagrada, who had never played it before. And who am I to say no? Now we've covered this dice drafting, stained glass, window making game quite a bit already on our show and blog, so I'm not going to get into the gameplay here. I will just note that in this three player game it was interesting because we had no scoring cards for columns or rows, and that really opened up the board for our options. I actually managed to fill a whole board, not that that helped me win. Friday Night Gloomhaven went really well. Uh, if you saw last week's show or in our update, we tried Scenario 10 and failed. Well, this week we went back to town, leveled up, bought some blessings, and headed back to the elemental plane. Despite having two characters get exhausted, Tori and I were able to finish off the mission successfully. We even managed to snag some treasure. Now, we are releasing our actual play videos right here on YouTube every Thursday at noon. And remember, you can join us live on Twitch at twitch.tv forward slash tabletop bellhop every Friday at 8.30 p.m. Eastern and watch us play Gloomhaven live. After Gloomhaven ended, we got in the first play of my new copy of Azul, Stained Glass of Sintra. Thanks again to patron Joe Swick for the awesome birthday gift. Stained Glass of Sintra is at times identical and at other times completely different from the base game of Azul. And I say base game, it's not an expansion, it is a standalone game. Overall, there's a lot more going on and a lot more to think about in Sintra. It's definitely a heavier game and harder to teach and learn because of that. Now that isn't to say that it's a heavy game by any means, just a step up in difficulty from the original Azul. If you check out the podcast, I go into the actual rule differences a lot more than I can here. Overall, I like it. I like the way it makes me think. It's definitely not just another Azul, but it didn't wow me the way Azul did. I liked it, but I wasn't rushing out to teach all my friends and encouraging everyone to buy it. Now, my feelings may change after more than just this one play. Now, this past week, Sean, my podcast co-host, finally beat book five in Harry Potter Hogwarts Battle. Congratulations, Sean. After realizing he was playing the game wrong, 
it ends up he was playing the extreme version, as we like to say here at Tabletop Bellhop. It's something to do with how you stack the villain deck for that book. So if you do get there in that game and you're having difficulty, double check the rules to make sure you're not messing them up. He also got in a game of checkers with his daughter, which is her favorite game. Announcements. I've got one quick announcement I'd like to make. March 15th to 17th, Sean, Deanna, and I will all be at Breakout Con. That's held at the Sheraton Center, downtown Toronto, Ontario. This is a fantastic gaming convention that features all forms of gaming. You've got RPGs, LARPs, miniature games, and a fantastic, uh, envious, I'm envious of this board game room with a huge game library, tons of open gaming space, and a lot of independent vendors. If you're going to be at the con and see us, be sure to come up and say hi. Though please don't be upset if I don't remember or recognize your name. I am terrible with names and I apologize ahead of time. Ask the Bellhop. We're here to answer your gaming game night questions. Today on Ask the Bellhop, we've got a question from Emmett O'Brien who asks, What are some underrated, lesser known, four to six player board games that can be played after dinner? I thought this was the perfect follow-up question to last week's episode where we answered two of your food-related questions. Follow the food with the gaming. Now by after dinner gaming, what I'm picturing is four to six people who just finished a good meal, looking for something to fill a good two to four hours before calling it a night. I'm thinking of groups looking for something light after the meal or possibly a different group looking for a nice, big, meaty game to fill the evening hours. Now, there are an insane number of amazing games that play four to five players. That seems to be the average board game player count is four to five. Now, there aren't a lot of games that play great with six. So I limited this list, these recommendations, to games that play at Emmett's maximum player count. Now, Emmett is also looking for lesser known games what I would call hidden gems. Now, I consume a lot of board game media, so what I consider a lesser known game may be different from you or another gamer. To me though, the games I'm about to list do fit the bill. If you think I'm wrong, let me know on social media. Now, I broke these games down into four categories and picked three games in each so as to be able to appeal to a wide group of gamers looking for various different after-dinner experiences. Up first, I've got party games. Games where socializing is the main focus, and the game is just some of the fun. Games that to play while having that after dinner digestive or two. My top recommendation here is a game I've mentioned many times on the show, and that's Concept. This is a clue guessing game where one player has to get the other players to guess their word, phrase, person, name, uh, using counters on a board that's filled with all kinds of icons. Now what I really dig about this one is you don't need anything like drawing skill, a great vocabulary, or trivia knowledge to play or be good at it. Up next, I have a very silly game called Ugtech. This is a fantasy flight game where you're gonna break your group into two teams. With six, this is perfect, three and three. One player on each team is gonna be a caveman who's trying to teach the other players of the team how to build a pattern out of wooden blocks. The trick though is they cannot speak English. Instead, they have to use a set of caveman-like words like a gunga and gestures like wiggling their hips to communicate with their team. The game even includes inflatable clubs to encourage your team members. Now my last party game recommendation is an almost unknown game from Z-Man Games called La Boca. This is another part pattern building game that uses wooden blocks, except this time it's played in pairs instead of teams. Now you get a pattern that shows you what you need to see and each player only sees one side of the pattern so you're sitting across from each other and the duo have to work together so that they're both going to see their pattern using the same set of blocks now it uses a round robin play style and scoring which means everyone gets to play with everyone else and the game even works at odd player counts this one is a brilliant game that we first tried at Extra Life, kindly donated by Z-Man Games. I wish this one was more readily available so more people could try it. Check it out. Up next, I'm going to move on to the lighter side of games. These are light games, still great for non-gamers, where you can still socialize, chat, and enjoy the evening while playing games. Now, my first recommendation is a 1990s classic that I almost never hear about anymore. And that game is Bonanza. 
This is a bean planting, negotiation-based card game where the neat trick is you can't rearrange your hand of cards. You have to play them in the order you're given them. And you want to trade away any cards you don't want to plant before you're forced to plant them. This is a fantastic high player count game with a ton of player interaction. I've had this game since it came out in the 90s and it still sees regular play at my game nights. Up next is a game we like to affectionately call Roman Bingo. The game is Rise of Augustus. It's a card-based tableau building game where you're adding provinces and senators to your empire. You do this by collecting resources like legions, chariots, and laurels. Now these resources are generated by being drawn one at a time out of a bag, thus the bingo reference. It seems very simple and light at first, but it's actually quite a deep game with actual strategies and tactics. This one is often a surprise hit at our game nights. Now my last light game is San Francisco Cable Car. This is a route building game that's a step up from Surro. Here you're trying to build the longest rail routes for your cable cars, and it's the fact that you have multiple cars on the board that makes this one so much more interesting to me than Suro. You're not just moving one dragon. You can also place your, place, place your tiles anywhere, so playing to shut down your opponents is almost as important as building your own routes. What's also cool is the game also has a stock market variant included in the box that kicks this up to the next difficulty level. Speaking of the next difficulty level, we're going to talk about some meteor fare. These are longer games that are probably going to be the focus of the evening, where people's attention is going to be on the game a lot more than the previous games we've mentioned. Now, everyone's heard of Scythe from Stonemaier Games, but have you heard of Euphoria, Build a Better Dystopia? In this game, you are a dictator managing your poor workforce, which are represented by dice. You're going to use and abuse these workers and get them to harvest resources and build important structures for your empire. The thing is, you can't let your workers get too smart or they'll realize how bad their life is and desert you. I think it's a rather fun and unique theme and this is a great worker placement game. Up next, I have Mutant Meeples. This is a puzzle-based board game. You've got a grid with walls all over it representing a city and on it are placed eight superhero members. Meeple. Each round, a target's placed on the map and players have to determine who can get their hero to the target in the shortest amount of time. Now this is a version of a sliding block puzzle. So the twist here is that each mutant meeple has a different power that breaks the rules in some way. One can jump over walls, one can stop at any point, and so on. This is a really neat game that is great for puzzle lovers. My last meteor game is Shadows Over Camelot. This is considered to be one of the first good examples of a cooperative board game, and it was, as far as I know, the first to add in rules for a hidden traitor. And to me, it is still the best example of that genre. In Shadows Over Camelot, players take on the role of a Knight of the Round Table as you travel around Camelot and try to complete quests and stall the advance of evil. The fact one of the knights may be working at cross purposes to the rest of the team is just the icing on the cake. Now finally, we get to the heavier fare. These are heavier games that are going to be the focus of the night. This is a sit down, we're going to play a heavy game, we're going to burn our brains and play games until the evening is done. This is going to probably be the one game. You're going to play one game to take up most, if not all, of your after dinner time. Now my first recommendation is Thunder Alley. This is a NASCAR race simulation game. Now wait, let me first say I am not a NASCAR fan. I don't like racing, I don't watch racing, but I love this game. This is a car driven race game where you play not one, but an entire team of cars. And it's how your whole team scores that matters, not just who's first after, over the checkered flag. Now GMT has come up with a brilliant movement system that actually does a great job of representing movement of a NASCAR pack. Check this one out. Now how about a food theme game for your after dinner game night? Check out Scoville, a game about harvesting, crossbreeding, and selling peppers. Toss in a chili cook-off for some bonus point fun. Scoville has one of the most unique themes out there and actually manages to tie them into the mechanics of the game. It is a very, very neat game. Perfect if you serve chili for dinner, tie it into the game after the dinner. Okay, I wanted to finish off with something big. I wanted a big, epic game. Now you're not gonna have time to play a Twilight Imperium, but if you got about four hours, you might be able to scratch that 4X itch with Martin Wallace's Struggle of Empires. Struggle is an age of Renaissance colonization game where you're building armies and fleets 
making alliances, establishing colonies, and improving your economy, and trying to do a better job at that than the other players while competing over limited land space. One thing I really dig about this game that I think makes it great for a social game night is that all negotiations and alliances are binding, so there won't be any backstabbing. So there you have 12 games I consider to be hidden gems that would be great for an after dinner game night with four to six players. Thanks, Emmett O'Brien, for the question. Do you have a gaming or game night question you would like us to tackle in a future Ask the Bellhop segment? You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to the website and click on Ask the Bellhop. We record a new episode of Tabletop Bellhop live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern. That's at twitch.tv forward slash tabletopbellhop. And we would love it if you joined us in the lobby, our live chat. An edited podcast version of that live show gets released every Tuesday. You can find it here on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash tabletop bellhop or on your podcatcher under the tabletop bellhop live. If you enjoy this content and the other content we're providing, it would be awesome if you'd consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Thank you for joining me for this episode of Express Check In. You can always find us across the web and on social media as Tabletop Bellhop One Word, or drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. Be sure to subscribe to our channel by clicking over here, and check out our latest video by clicking over here. I am Mo Tuzano, the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge. Good night and game on.